Welcome to Archery Country Podcast. Welcome everybody back to another episode of Archery Country Podcast. As we're up in Brainerd, Minnesota at our Brainerd location, we have Jason and Alex and Scott in the house along with myself, Wade, as we are talking to the Cowboy Carp Killers and today's episode is about bow fishing and everything. We're going to go through everything. So you can be brand new to bow fishing or you can be a 10-year veteran and we're still going to entertain you. I promise that. So how are you guys doing today? Very well. Good. Awesome. Let's go around the horn just for our listeners that are not too familiar with you guys from Brainerd. Uh, Jason, you started off a little history about yourself and uh, your career with archery country and then bow fishing. Yeah, I've been bow hunting for about 30 years. Probably been shooting bow for about 40 years. Started bow fishing in, I think, 05, 06. Went to archery country when there was just the Wake Park location. I had Brandon and Jake set me all up and started right. driving around from river to river, shooting fish off the banks. So you're a seasoned veteran, we could say. I guess you could say that. You've seen everything from the technical I, advances. I still miss a lot. <laughs> that's that's the awesome thing about bow fishing. I don't know. Your home is up here in Brainerd now. I live about halfway back towards Little Falls. Okay. Alex, he's, uh, I guess he's our new baby of our tree country, but a uh, very, very accomplished bow hunter and bow fisherman. Yeah, so I've been with Archery Country now for a year. Started down in the Rogers store and then recently moved up to the Brainerd store. Um, been shooting bow for about 10 years now, bow hunting for about six. Um, been bow fishing for about three or four years. This year, just got a new boat, so looking to expand the bow fishing range a little bit more. And uh, Brainerd now owns alex i guess as an employee but he was like he said he started in rogers you're gonna hear me throughout this podcast say pony that's his nickname so i apologize that pony is alex alex is pony but uh awesome to have you on and then of course the capitan of brainerd scott <laughs> so like you said my name is scott i've been born in the brainerd lakes area you know i'm been hunting and fishing for all my life pretty much uh, I got my first bow fishing boat about oh, three, four years ago now. Never done it from shore, so I'm kind of interested to hear some of the stories about that because I've never done that. I've always been in a boat, so it's going to be interesting. Been with Archer Country almost eight years now. Awesome. So, Awesome. So as we go down this little uh, roller coaster ride we call bow fishing, there's going to be some peaks and valleys. We're going to take your emotions. We're going to twist them a little bit on the side of it. We're going to educate you, and then we're going to tell some personal stories. The history of bow fishing in general is probably, if not the fastest growing archery, um, what would you, uh, not an event, but a chapter of archery, I guess. Uh, Now it seems, when I started 10 years ago, uh, you'd be lucky if you go a week and see one or two other boats, uh, you know, at night fishing. A couple guys, of course, on on the river or the creeks. But back in the day, you know, everybody was chasing suckers. And they'd have a pitchfork, and whenever that opened, I mean, back 10 years ago, there was an actual season opener. It wasn't all year. So that tells you just a little bit of advance. Was, but now you'd be lucky if you go at night and not see one or two other rigs, and that, that's during the week. So i have been a ton of advancements. But bow fishing in general, I, I, I guess where it originated is if you talk about carp, that's probably one of the most common target fish when we speak bow fishing you're fishing for rough fish or you're shooting rough fish uh carp are now an invasive species there's a bunch of subcategories on carp and we'll get to those but let you know common carp they're back in the 80s um maryland is where they started and they were a a farm fish out of a farm pond and they went but now when we say the word invasive they are they're in almost every lake rivers and there's in the subcategories of it but they can wreak havoc on freshwater fish as far as destroying beds uh, a carp like a 20 pound carp will release however many millions of eggs close to 2 million you 2. know 1.5 1. Yeah. 1. to 2.5 so i have my techie guy jason if you guys you heard him on our uh, earlier podcast if there's any statistics that i need i'm going to call upon jason because he's like a brit walking brain and takes care of us on that. But 2.5 million, you're saying, an average 20-pound fish, mm-hmm. and they hatch within a week? 
a little over a week. Yeah. Survival rate obviously is not that, but um, completely, completely can wreck a lake. And over the last 10 years, from bounty shoots to tournaments to guys just having a blast, guys and gals, the numbers have gone down. It's a slowly, slow, slow, slow uh, drop down in invasive sp- fish in lakes. So we've been doing our part, but it's still a ton of fun. And then we're not just talking about lakes. You can do it in rivers, creeks, anywhere, I guess, wherever the fish are. So that's, that's the basic history of it. But uh, when you guys got started, were you, were you fishing lakes or were you walking? What were you doing, Jason? Driving around from creek to creek, river to river, Sock River a lot. I was probably the main thing. Hit every bridge on the Sock River from Lake Osakis almost all the way back to St. Cloud. And then every night. that's prob- in the night or in the day? Uh, mostly, at, mostly at night. Okay. Usually a lot of creeks during the day. So you guys would have headlamps or floodlights or were you? Yeah, when I first started, uh, lights were illegal. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Like on your bow or whatnot, Mm -hmm. but I don't know, headlamps Mm -hmm. was the big thing. That seemed to work the best back before. Now they have the bow mounted lights that work very well. I guess, uh, Scott, you, you've been doing it for a while, too, and you said you got a boat a couple of years ago, mm-hmm. so now probably lake fishing or river. Yeah, you know, well, we when I started, about. it was always on a river. Okay. That's where, you know, luckily here in Brainerd, we have a few main rivers that come together, um, so we'd always go on the river and the backwaters. Um, last year, we spent a lot of time on littler lakes, um, trying to help them out a little bit because they're starting to get in tough shape now. Mm-hmm. You and know. Alex, you've been, you kind of done both? Mm-hmm. Um, shot on a couple of different guys' boats, but started out just fishing a couple of local bridges, and then all of a sudden seen some guys bow fishing and grabbed a bow mostly during the day, just shooting, and then just recently starting to get into that night shooting a lot more. And when I started, so it was, it was we we're obviously ten years younger than this, <clears throat> so uh, before kids and and you could go out on a night. But anyways, our buddies, we just took, we went to Menards. And we got six halogens, and we had a generator. Uh, I don't even think we had a trolling motor at the time. We just run the, the it was like a little 25 horse. And uh, we thought we were in heaven. I had a 70-pound Hoyt Ultratech or something like that with a release that I was shooting. And back in the day, you would shoot, you could have 100 fish nights. Uh, but the advancements now, uh, and we'll get into equipment a little bit, but I, uh, I'm a little bit different as I've only fished the river probably four or five times, um, down by Hudson, uh, never, ever. And I've lived in Minnesota forever, never been on the Mississippi up this way or, uh, you know, down around Rogers location, but lakes, uh, coming from the Alexandria area, the chain of lakes in every little lake around there has been uh, very, very good. And of course there's some secret spots that I'm not going to tell you, but it's an invasive fish, so it's not like a target walleye or something like that. <laughs> but uh, let's start. Let's start talking about uh, you know the lakes. If you're fishing a lake and you said rivers, let's distinguish the differences. Are you shooting them the same? Are you fishing them the same? I mean, yeah, pretty much. I mean, a lot of times before I go to wherever I'm going to go, I go on the Minnesota DNR website. They do an awesome job of saying what kind of is a carp, bullhead, dogfish. You know, mm-hmm. I mean. There's little lakes that you can go shoot all night, but you might not go get a carp. Right. You know, so you got to kind of pick what you want to do there. If you want to go after a carp, you're better off on a river, in my opinion. You know, if you want to just shoot, shoot, and shoot, go to a mm-hmm. lake. I mean, because they're full of dogfish and, yep. you know, suckers and stuff like and that. And what you're talking about is, like, the netting results? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. The DNR does an awesome job with that. So maybe we ought to break down fish, our targets. Um Rough fish. I know that's a huge category to cover, but obviously carp. Yes. Um, we can say bowfin or a dogfish more people are probably familiar with. Bullheads are in that category. Correct. Um, and, of course, you're, the great thing about night fishing, <clears throat> you're going to see everything. Every walleye, every northern, every bass, every sunny, every crappie. But we're strictly, and regulations say, only rough fish. And I'm... I'm talking for the state of Minnesota. We'll talk about some other states because in our previous conversation, some of us have gotten the opportunity to go to other states. It can be a lot of fun, especially if you go down south. That's a whole different prehistoric fish down there that they they can tackle. So that's what we're talking about, rough fish. 
um, targeting common carp is the most common. Um, and actually, <clears throat> if you speak of like a buffalo, people say buffalo. I didn't know this until I looked it up, but buffalo is actually in the sucker category. It's not in the carp. So we say buffalo or, bu- you know, buffalo carp, whatever it may be. Uh, gar. Correct. Is it a long nose gar? Is it all? Is it all walks of gar? Is, is there subspecies of that? I think it's yeah. gar. I think it's I think gar in general. You can shoot any yeah. gar if, if I remember correctly. I mean, and those you're going to find more on a river. Correct. Set up, you and know, so, more south. south. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Up this way, up in the Brainerd area, the bow fishing really starts on the sucker runs. Sucker runs? Yeah. And that's here, another that's, rough fish. Yeah. That you... Super popular here is everybody crashing all the creeks and walking up and down creeks at night for the suckers. I love it. And the suckers can get big. Oh, yeah. You know, not quite as big as a common. Um, night. Okay, so fishing lakes and rivers. Did Jason, you you fished rivers a lot? You said that's kind of yeah. how you got started. Yeah. But now, which do you do you prefer a lake or do you prefer a smaller lake or do you prefer a river or does it? If you can go boat fishing, you don't care. Well, pretty much, I'd bow fish anything. But I won't lie, I grew. You know, started bow fishing more and more, and for me, it was more the rivers and. I had a good time, and I didn't really see the need for the boat and everything. Well, mm-hmm. then I went out with Scott on his boat for the first time. And I'll tell you what, I don't know that I would do it any other way anymore. I mean, the cricks and stuff are fun, but out on the boat, you just yeah. see, like you were saying, you see everything. You're seeing all kinds of game fish, which is just interesting to see. Absolutely. And then I think the quality of fish, you can get a lot bigger fish out on the boat. Right. So, and, and Alex, you just got a brand new, like literally a week old, maybe last week. Did you go get him? Yep. So that's going to be a couple of weeks by the time you guys hear this podcast. Having a boat is such a great tool. One, we talked about the advancements of getting out, but everything is in the boat. Your barrel is in the boat. You're not having to bring a fish to shore and put it in a gunny sack or whatever you may be, or pick them up later. Usually you have a, a fish barrel or a trough or a water tank or whatever it may be. Your arrows are all in the boat. Your extra bows are in the boat. Everything that you need is in the boat. Uh, and then, of course, you know, the advancements of lighting. And and you got a little bit different rig than most of us are used to fishing. I, I We fish out of a 17 and a half inch John boat, or foot inch. That's a little <laughs> boat. But, 17 uh, so, foot six inch. <laughs> <laughs> we, have a, uh, we have six HPS lights and then six LEDs on the front. Um, and then we got four in the back. We run an inverter off of generator that runs out, and then we got an 80-pound Minn Kota, actually saltwater edition trolling motor. That's our rig. We have a deck, but it's not an elevated deck. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. But uh, it, everything is there. And, of course, it costs a little bit of money to have that, but it, I think it's way easier and way more enjoyable. And like you say, everybody likes size. You know, size does matter. And that's where you're going to be able to find, don't get me wrong, in the rivers or in the creeks, shallow water you can find some fish sometimes you're not going to find the big 40 pounders but uh, the lakes you can but like also what you said scott you can go all night on a lake if you didn't do your research and Correct. shoot five dogfish and go around it can happen it can happen what do you prefer or alex night or day fishing um just recently since the boat night fishing is coming a lot lot nicer um just like everybody's been saying, though, you can see everything in the lake, um, lights everything up, and also, depending on lights, you can see a lot better, too, and the fish actually stand out across the bottom instead of having the glare of the sunlight. And That brings up easy. a great point. Um, yeah, if you're day fishing, I whenever someone says day fishing, to me, it's in a back bay, completely glass water, and you have the best pair of polarized glasses that your money can buy is the only way you're going to see a fish unless they're, is porpoising the right word? Mm -hmm. Surfacing. Uh, Usually spawn is when you're going to see them in the shallows in the bay during the daylight. Night fishing is is way easier for me. Correct. But uh, there's a lot of guys that have success during the day, especially during Mm -hmm. spawn. Right. I know a big problem around here is going out of the day, there's so many people out on the lake. Ah, yeah. And any kind of ripple from a boat going by to a jet ski, it affects what you can see. Where at night, you don't got to deal with all them people. 
you know, but then you got to deal with, you know, being respectful, not being too close to houses of people trying to sleep when you got these great big lights or, you know, a generator or in Alex's case, his new fan boat, you know, just trying to be respectful. But at night you just see so much more because you don't have all the other people to deal with on the lake. A lot more free time. It's quieter, stuff like that. So, and that's, this is a a word that I'm going to strongly encourage. Regulations. You have to know your regulations, especially night fishing. Cause it's, it's a sport just like regular fishing, a standard individual fish angling license. You're covered. But as far as shooting, uh, you have to be so many feet from an occupied structure. Right. I believe it's 50 feet, if I'm correct on that. It's 50 feet from a dwelling, if I remember right. 50 feet from a dwelling, occupied structure, I believe is 150, 150 feet. Is, okay. Yeah, 100. And when we say occupied structure, night fishing, you guys can relate to this. First thing that's going to happen at Memorial Day or 4th of July, somebody's up at the house and they see a big boat come by with lights. First thing they do is come down to the dock. Hey, what are you doing? We're not being dorks or mean that we can't come in and see you. We regulations say we can't, can't discharge our bow. We can put our bows away and come see you. But so you have to know your regulations and every lake is general, but there are some lakes that you can't fish or can't bow hunt, I guess. And especially in town, there's going to be city statutes that you got to follow as well. Like they consider a, a bow, a firearm, so you can't discharge a firearm in city limits unless you have the proper paperwork. And we'll get to that as well as far as city shoots. So we kind of all agree night fishing is, it, any kind of bow fishing is awesome. Night fishing, you're going to see a lot more. Let's talk about our rigs. <clears throat> our bows. First and foremost, there's four, we'll break it down in four categories of tools that you need. First, the bows. And Jason, I'm going to turn this over to you and Alex and Scott. Go through a compound setup, a recurve setup, and then what we call our new lever bows that are kind of, they're not really new last five years. All night is a huge company that had done that, but now Muzzy's yeah. on board. But uh, tell me your favorite and then kind of break down the differences. Well, I think for me, I guess probably and Scott will agree with us, tried and true recurve. We love the recurves. Quick. Really? Oh. Really? So quick. Absolutely. Um, I just think that they aim better. You mean you quick, quick from like arrow speed or quick that you can shoot, snap yeah, shoot? Snap shoot. You can okay. just get off shot so fast. I mean, yeah. I've been in situations where you've had to make that quick shot and you can draw that bow back a foot and just let one fly and, you know. It, so that's I think that's they're, surprising, uh, but I understand <laughs> completely what you're saying. Yeah. They're quicker. I mean, combones definitely have their place. I think they're, I just don't like let off when I'm bow fishing at all. Yep. So, but they are smoother. They're easier on you. I think a combine you're going to, depending on your conditioning of shooting, how many arrows you're used right. to shooting. Well, I would definitely steer a beginner towards maybe a little smoother draw on bow. But I think a big thing for us is we're so tall. Yeah. You know, so we don't have to worry about hitting the bridges with our compound yeah. or excuse me, our recurves or, you know, the do- the boat or nothing where my wife is fairly short. So she prefers a compound. She can swing it more easily. It's just more maneuverable for her. And do you have a deck on your boat? I do. And a railing? I do have a rail. My yeah. rail is about two feet tall. So there's another point, you know, if, yeah. uh, let's say, uh, yeah, like your wife is shorter. You're six. I'm six, four. So yeah. And Jason's right there more than that. Alex is a big guy. I'm a big guy. We don't really have to worry about that rail, right? Or like you said, on a bridge, and getting over. But I'm, I'm I'm actually very very surprised that a recurver is what your guys are shooting, right? Um, and then the compound, Alex. I'm, I'm going to talk to you about the new quote unquote air quotes lever bow, which is kind of a crossbred between the two. Why do you like shooting them? Explain what they are, and then why you like shooting them. So the lever bow is going to be a little bit goofier than some people have seen. They're going to be, it's going to look like you just took recurve limbs and stuck them on compound limbs. So it's going to be a little bit different design on them, but they're going to be really close to a compound. You can still have your let offs on them. Um, very adjustable for that and draw length. Um, so when your let offs are obviously going to give you different 
um, amounts of power and everything like that. But I like shooting them. It just gives us a little bit different feel. You're not getting that full cam type of feel as you would with a compound. You're not getting that no let off feel from a recurve. So it's kind of a mix of in between. Um, you can still snap shoot them. Um, very, very adjustable with many different um, features on them. So, just and, what, and what these it. guys, when, we're, when we say snap shooting, there's scenarios where you're not drawing all the way back on a fish. Um, you push a fish up into the shallows or you break one off off of the shore and you're in a foot and a half of water, or two feet of water, and things are happening fast. You're not going to, it's not like today's compound bows where you draw back and you hold and you hold and you're executing your release and your follow through. There's sometimes you're, and you're not really aiming. It's an instinctive. There's nothing worse for your <laughs> archery form. Than <laughs> <laughs> that, that is very, very the true. Off balance, crooked but shooting you do. That's, that's what we're talking about when we say snap shooting is getting the shot off fast um, because of the predicaments that you're in. And I shoot, I still shoot an AMS uh, Fire Eagle. And that is a compound bow. So it's a split limb design, but I don't have a draw mod in it. There's no end in my draw. I can go all the way back to 30 inches if I needed to. I can go back if it's a really deep shot or a bigger fish and I have time, or I can go back three inches on the draw and I can fire it. So that's a little bit of the combination of your recurve and with limbs and cams. And there's also been some advancements we carry here in the shop. Uh, Muzzy just comes to the tip of my tongue as far as their compound bow. It's a bow fishing bow, but that has, correct me if I'm wrong, that has mods. Correct. So you can actually have your draw length if you're shooting. And we're all shooting, I take that back, I'm assuming we're shooting fingers, us four here. Yep. Mm -hmm. I would say yes. 95% of the guys that are going, guys and gals, are going hardcore shooting fingers. One for speed, durability, and it's just one less thing to worry about. Yeah, just simple. <clears throat> now, I have had my butt whipped by, there's a group of guys out of St. Cloud that still shoot Hoyt compound bows with the releases. I won't release their name, but they're very, very popular, and they're very, very good at what they do. Somehow they make it work. I think it just depends on what you get used to. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really does. I mean. And that is kind of the beauty of bow fishing is, you can make a lot of different things work. Yeah. Really. I mean, yeah. And if, if, you know, Papa has a bow hanging down in the garage that here, have it. And you come into archery country, 15, 30 minutes, we can have you rigged, mm -hmm. run you through it. it. It's not a rocket science to set one up and you can be shooting and not spend a whole lot of money. I mean, you can go off the deep end like we do, <laughs> but, uh, you know, overall, if you look at my bow package, I think I got total like $300 when it was brand new, you know, compared to some of our other higher end compounds and recurves that are out there. So that was one thing we're talking about equipment, our bows. Second most important in my mind over the arrow would be your retrieval system. Um, we call them retrievers or reels. What do you guys shoot? What do you like? What do you think of the others? Um, I shoot a bottle reel most of the time, like AMS bottle reel. Mm -hmm. um, when I started, I had that drum on the front of your bow. I, oh. I, I recommend steering clear of those. <laughs> it's a death trap. <laughs> it's a poked out eye waiting to happen, but that's all there was, and that's what I had. And um, I don't know. Alex can talk more about the spin cast type reels. Uh, they seem to be a pretty uh, popular thing and kind of – and lean in that way myself, maybe trying one out. Yeah. Yeah, so like Jason said, I'm more into that spin cast or Zebco type reel. Um, those, you're actually going to have more of like a drag system on them. So you're going to be able to adjust drag on them to also fight fish, and then there's going to be multiple different styles. There's quite a few brands out there now that are going to have those type of reels on them. Um, they're going to mount onto your front, kind of in your stabilizer hole, versus onto the side of like where your site is. Um they're going to be just obviously like that little bit different design on them with a drag system, but. And that's the, the difference of a bottle reel system. Uh, I don't know about you, Jason, and I didn't ask you what you shoot yet, but we'll get there. I'm not fighting a fish with my, the bottle reel. Uh, I set the bow down and I fight it much like a tip up, you know, I'm hand over hand, I bring it in. And for the most part, I don't get too tangled up. 
Um, but Alex, you're actually fighting the fish for the most part. Yep. With your reel, yep, just like you would a rod and a reel. You got a little stabilizer mount in the front of your bow. Yep. And they actually make kind of like a little fishing rod. It's like one eyelet on that you can mount on top of your spin cast reel. So it, and essentially it's a really short spin or spin cast rod right on the front of your bow. And what do you use, Scott? I shoot the AMS. You know, just because I don't have to worry about hitting a button when I shoot or nothing. Yeah. It's just free flowing. So, and they're twenty five feet of line is what we fit in there. Twenty five yards. Twenty five yards. It's a lot more. See, that's why I told you I got a techie guy here. <laughs> <laughs> but um, okay, so there, those are the two most common. We talked about a drum, but let's just take that and wrap it up and throw it away. Yeah, where it should be. If you need to use it. Just come into the shop, and we'll get you hooked up the right way. Um, third, let's talk about arrows. There's four or five categories of arrows. I know my favorite. Let's see what the panel has to say. Like, what's your your, your go-to arrow? Do you have 10, 15 of them? Do you have one of them? Like, what, what would you run, and what would you prescribe to somebody? I, I pretty much keep it basic with just, like, the two-prong cart points. I've ran, like, the AMS Anchor QT. I've lost some big fish because I felt like that QT that screws off in the back Scott was with or took me at one night. And I like the three-point grapple head, but I just feel like I like to keep it simple, something that's easily, if anything did go wrong, very easy to fix, new point, Mm -hmm. new knock. I just, you know. And a fiberglass arrow? Fiberglass arrow. Full length, we're not cutting them down. We're coming what they get to. Yeah, I'd get them longer if I could. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the Gentle Giant has a 33-inch draw yeah. total. So, yeah, uh, in a fiberglass arrow, they do make aluminum arrows. Um, I have played around with them. Uh, great company, AMS, uh, along with Muzzy, they've brought them out. I, I didn't have a lot of success. I had success. I shot the fish. The problem is if you get into a hard bottom or if you miss the fish, your aluminum's not going to last near as long. You're not going to get your bang for the buck, I guess you could say. Um, Alex, you have a go-to? So I've been shooting quite a few. I'm more into that bigger barb, um, and it's going to be a little bit different. So I'm shooting like the bigger three or four barb, kind of like the iron barbs from Muzzy or otherwise the anchors, I believe, from... Mm-hmm. Um, AMS, but recently I've been shooting the TNT style, and they make those in two, three, or four barb. Um, those are what I've been shooting. Um, I like to shoot a little bit heavier, so I've been shooting um, a tip on them that you can put actually a heavyweight ferrule on them. So I'm actually getting a little bit more weight up front there. I've been noticing a little bit better um, penetrating fish. So I mean, that's one thing you can always do with arrows too. And then I'm shooting kind of like a carbon weave type of arrow on mine. Um, just what I had at the time when I got the shafts and everything to build everything. So, but you're, you can definitely use fiberglass arrows and have the same results. Scott. Yeah. So I'm a lot like Alex. I prefer an all carbon arrow versus a fiberglass. Mm -hmm. You know, they're a little bit, not as strong as fiberglass, but I don't got to worry about the slivers, you know, um, another nice thing about a carbon arrow. Oh, you broke your knot, put a new Mm -hmm. one in it. You're good to go. Or fiberglass, you got to glue them on. Well, mm-hmm. then you got more stuff in your boat, more yep. stuff you're trying to do in the dark. So I just prefer an all carbon arrow. And the personally. thing about you, you can wherever you get your arrows. Um, if you find at a point, the cool thing about most of these fiberglass or carbon uh, aluminum, well, you can change out your points. Um, <clears throat> and I'm not just talking about twisting the sharp point off of the actual point ferrule which I strongly encourage having a package of sharp points, especially if you're going to fish on a river rock bottom or Mm -hmm. you get into where, you know, stuff's going to dull that up. The barb apparatus, like a two barb or a wire that comes back, the way you get your fish off after you you bring the fish into the boat, usually you're twisting it one way or the other or the ferrule or the point, and then the barbs will reverse, and you're pulling the arrow out. What I have noticed is I've switched to a grapple from – It doesn't matter if it's March 1st all the way until December. And here's why. Because you're going to run into big fish anywhere you go if you do your research. And we've all had it. It happens. A fish will get off. But it the lower chance of it giving off like a three-blade grapple, and they're not blades, 
They're not sharp. I want to make that clear right now. But it is a blade system and a grapple. When it goes through the fish, they expand. So it can, I don't know the exact dimensions. Maybe Jason does. <laughs> but that grapple has three blades that's keeping the fish on. And then I just loosen the tip of it. The grapples go the opposite direction. I pull it out. Another reason is I fish a lot of tournaments. thing about tournaments is keeping the fish in the boat. One, if it's a big fish for your big five, big six, big ten, whatever it may be. Two, numbers game, especially if you get to a bounty shoot. So keeping the fish there. And third, the reason that I shoot a grapple is as we have experienced some above average temperatures lately, our water temperature keeps going up. When you get into end of July, August, and that's, you know, the dog days of summer, the fish get soft. And that's another reason where I've had regular barb points, you know, pull out of a soft fish. So that's why I shoot a three grapple, um, rather be an anchor. There's a plethora of different points that you can put on, but keeping the, the actual point sharp is another deal. You know, they have chisel tips, they have beveled tips, they have a whole bunch of different things that you can put there. But that, uh, that kind of, for as far as equipment, and again, they're not overly expensive. There's some guys that run lasers, um, I got my own two cents on lasers. Uh, I think they have their purpose for some areas, but we what we haven't talked about is deflection mm-hmm. in water. We'll get there because that's a 30-minute conversation. <laughs> um, and then you know, some guys will shoot lighted knocks. I think it's cool. And I'm not kidding. When we started, 100 fish night was normal. That's 175 shots, so your equipment's got to hold up. Um but, the, I mean, there is a, a kind of a cool thing of watching a lighted knock, you know, go off into it. I shoot with so many lights on the boat that a lighted knock doesn't do me much good. But I could see, especially for day fishermen, if they got shadows from the trees or whatever and they're shooting into a river, that might be beneficial on that sense of things. As far as equipment, the bow setup, is there anything else I'm missing? It's not fishing line. No. It's a braid material like a dacron yeah i don't even know how many pounds they're rated do you depends how much do your uh, spin cast come with whether that 150 or 175 yep 150 some you can run 200 on but most of the time it's at 150 pound braided yeah i know some of the ams like the tnt comes with i think a 350 pound braided yeah and then the regular ones is i think a 200 pound braided so let's uh Let's dive on in to uh, fishing. How do, how do guys, how do you do your research? I basically go off word of mouth. I have looked on the Minnesota DNR website, uh, lake reports or netting reports. <clears throat> they have the average size, I believe, and then a mm-hmm. quantity. And they're only netting a very, very small portion of the lake. Yeah, correct. Um, I don't really fish big, big water. Uh, A lot of guys will have success on that, but I don't. Um, Back bays, smaller lakes, shorelines. Let's talk a little bit about lakes and rivers. And I don't have a lot of experience with the river. Scott and Jason, Alex, you guys have to chime in on that. But uh, what are you looking for? Are you basically going off of DNR reports or word of mouth, or what are you guys going to? Uh, A little bit of everything. It just kind of depends upon what kind of weed structure is in there. Um, There again. I prefer the river because you just can get away from houses more often. And then two, on a windy night, it doesn't matter on a river normally. Because right. 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 you can hide, you know, and, and pretty much fish wherever. Where lakes, you got to, wind comes into play a little bit more there and stuff like that. I got you. Any part of the river? Shallow. Yeah. Backwater Any, bays. Yeah, backwater bays. Anything shallow. Um, Weed you know, edges. I know a spot here in Brainerd that Jason and I go quite a bit that, there's a weed bay out in the middle of the river. Oh, really? Yeah. So it's probably really, just loaded. It's a lot of fun. When they're in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, Alex, you 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 drive extensively all over the state, <clears throat> and I've only known you for a year, but you know you've probably been out more than any of us this year, which says a lot. And of course, with your new boat, the sky's the limit for you. But uh, you know, if you got a new body of water, is it, is it word of mouth? Yeah, a little bit. Um, 
But then a big thing, so I, like I'm shooting more tournaments now. Last year I shot a couple, and then this year with my new boat, hoping to actually get in some more, a lot more tournaments this year. So that's going to bring you into a lot of different parts in your in Minnesota. Not every tournament's the same spot, so you're going to have to expand on the lakes that you're shooting. You're going to have to do a little bit of research. First off, when I'm going, quick DNR survey look, couple lakes, say hey, this looks good, or even Google Maps, just to look yeah. at some weed structure to look at the lake. Is it clear? Because on Google Maps, some lakes are going to be like a real pea green, dark, you're going to be like, okay, well, that we might need to cross off, might not be able to see. So that's another thing, too, is going to be the water clarity just by looking at maps and stuff like that. But otherwise, a lot of people... They've been doing this for a long time, too, so there is some guys who still know some spots around, and <clears throat> some of them are willing to give them up. Obviously, some aren't. So that's and and you can go uh, on the DNR website again, um, not pumping their horn, but they have water clarity mm-hmm. charts. Mm-hmm. Uh, when we say that, I, I would stay – and, and, and a lake can change. For example, this week, uh, Alex, you went out last night. Uh, I got a report from the Chain of Lakes area. The water right now is horrible yes. on big water yep. because of all the wind and these thunderstorms that we've had. You have to get into shallow water or back out of the wind somewhere or stick to smaller lakes or rivers. You know, a lot of guys are making that chance. Every, every, I wouldn't say every day a lake can change, but in a week you can go from an eight foot clarity down to three foot. For sure. And that'll ruin it you know, just as fast as anything is you get everybody out there and you're ready to rock and roll. And all of a sudden you're like, Oh man, and HPSs are not, not doing what they're supposed to do. I can only see a foot. And I mean, frustrating when you get into a back bay and there's 75 million boils and you can see everything and it looks like chocolate milk. <laughs> you can see fish's fins, but you can't see the fish. That can be frustrating, mm-hmm. but it's part of it. You know, we're not, not going out and shooting tons of fish every night. It's still hunting, fishing, quote unquote. Um, Jason, what do you do lake wise, river wise? You just going off of you've been doing it probably the longest out of all of us. Just going off, are you fishing memories or are you are you trying new waters every year? Mm, when I first started it was basically just driving around and checking everywhere. And then you just kinda make a checklist. All right, I've stopped here like ten times and I've never seen a fish. So, you know, the next time, just maybe stop there again someday. But for now, skip off to the hot spots. Yeah. And then, like, I use the DNR Lake Finder, you know, website quite a bit just to see if that lake actually has fish that I want to target in there. Mm -hmm. If there is dogfish and there is, I mean, you get up this way and they're not as prevalent in every lake. They, you know, the very clear lakes just don't yep. support them as well as some of the lakes down <clears throat> south and the agricultural areas. And a thing, another thing, um, we haven't really spoke a word of mouth. I'm not talking other bow fishermen that are out there because some of us are conceited and we don't want to share everything. <laughs> but you go to a landing an hour before dark when all of your league fishermen are coming off, all your bass fishermen, and they'll tell you they're very, very open in my experience I seen carp rolling up in this bay off of the north end, you know. <clears throat> they might have seen them at noon when the water temperature was up and they're in there. But that is another tool that you can use. And another, you pull into a gas station and people see that you have a bow fishing rig and they'll come over and they'll talk to you. And they'll say, yep, they've been rolling over here in this bay. Or they're, you know, they're in the channel thick, like bumping off the bottom of the boat thick. A bass fisherman, which all you guys are very, very avid fishermen for freshwater fish, sport fishing um you can tell when there's carp up rolling i mean you know what's going on and they do too and that's another great thing you know word of mouth i'm not saying approach somebody say hey where's all them carp at i'm gonna go shoot them um but word of mouth can be also a very good tool uh for lakes and of course i i fish where i was born and raised in the alexander area there's you know i can count right now i could name off 35 lakes that have carp in them and have big carp in them and still do. The numbers have gone down a little because of fishing pressure. But I think as long as you do just a little bit of homework, you can be very successful on that. And like I say, you don't have to have a boat. You can go fish creeks and rivers and, and be very successful. Um, a little bit of a 
touchy subject in bow fishing is what you're doing with the fish. Get asked this all the time. I mean, every day almost. Yeah, and that, and even that topic too, as unfortunately us bow fishermen kind sometimes can get put into kind of a bad type of not want us doing it because there is some guys who don't know what to do and they kind of throw them wherever and they do give us a bad name unfortunately and that's just why it's as fun as going out and shooting them you still have to take care of your fish it's not it's a responsibility Mm -hmm. Um, there are different outlets to help you Uh, you guys you kind of tell me what you do with yours if it's early season there's an actual it's a reptile facility that that allows us to dump our fish they take them they actually will pay you a certain amount you know, per fish. Uh, they have some pretty good restrictions, so you got to kind of know what you're doing there, and you got to co- get in contact with them. Um, we've actually been in contact with some mink farms that will take the fish, and uh, they keep them up and use them as... So you're recycling. You're getting an invasive species out of the lake. The last thing that you want to do is go back in a back bay. It's 1, 2, 3 o'clock at night, and you're like, well, what are we going to do with them? I can't bury them in my townhome you know, lot. <clears throat> and they throw them on the shore. I'm going to tell you right now, if I was to ever see somebody doing that, I will quit my night of fishing and I will slice your tires and, and ruin your, I mean, that is, that is the worst thing, as Alex was saying. It gives us a bad name. And another thing is I have four or five farmers on my phone. After, you know, 10 years of doing this, I'll call them up and say, hey, uh, you know, I got a, a water tank full of fish you mind if I go back where I always did in your cornfield and, you know, sometimes I have to hand dig them in. Sometimes I can use a skid loader. And, of course, if you have private ground, that's cool. But you can use it as fertilizer. Um, there are very few, but there are some people that will eat some. You know, I, I don't eat them. But, uh, you know, you, you just got to you gotta live up to that responsibility. Mm-hmm. Are you guys, you guys just taking care of it at your home place or do you bring them somewhere? Back a long time ago, I used to just go knock on farmers' doors who had manure piles and see if they'd just let you put them next to a manure pile, and then they'd push them under and compost them. Mm -hmm. Um, I did bury them in my garden, too, using them for fertilizer in my own garden at times. But for the most part, I'd see if just go talk to farmers. I mean, they're more than happy to take whatever you've got, especially like when they have a pile of manure, it's nothing. Mm-hmm. they're turning that over all the time anyway so so it's just a you you got to take care of your fish um whichever means necessary even if you got to drive a little bit you know to do it strongly encourage that tournaments um now have become just as big as we said bow fishing is is grown leaps and bounds there's a ton of tournaments just in the state of minnesota if you wanted to open up the country you could go to a tournament every weekend from May 1st, you know, all the way to you could go south if you wanted. But there, I would say there's probably five or six really, really good tournaments in the state of Minnesota. I'm not going to say that you're going to get rich doing it, but I don't think that's the reason that you're in it. Um, you guys, what? tell me a little bit about your tournament career. Or, you know, if you fished off and on, do you really care about it? I know Alex Alex is chomping at the bit right now because <laughs> he actually, were you just in a tournament? So not yet. Um, we got one coming up here on June 20th. It's actually Alberta Wildlife Tournament. Um, so that's going to be one where I'm driving to a new part of the state, never been before, so that's going to be doing a little bit of scouting. But as far as tournaments, Minnesota, especially being a state that we have a decibel level for our boats and our rigs. So that's going to be another thing, too, where it's going to limit. A lot of bow fishermen is going to be a big part of bow fishing, especially down south, is going to be airboats, which those are going to be exceeding that decibel level and not going to be legal in Minnesota. So it's also going to keep them guys out of Minnesota from fishing these tournaments. So with that being said, some of these tournaments are a little bit smaller end tournaments, like that around 30-ish boat tournament. So it's going to give guys who maybe don't have them big nice rigs, who just have their dad's old rig or just something you threw up on a budget just quick wanted to get on the water and have some fun so that's also going to be another good thing about minnesota is you don't need and in general you do not need a big fancy rig to go out and shoot fish plenty of guys go out go to the hardware store buy lights go anything and do that 
So that's one just advantage of being in Minnesota. Tournaments tend to not get as big as other states. Yeah, and and guys win with just a little. I mean, mm-hmm. the littlest John boat you could see, and <clears throat> hardware lights. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. We encourage that, you know, just to get out there. To me, and we bring out uh, not clients but new friends or new bow fishermen every year. Then you watch for the first hour, their eyes get this big like a saucer and then they start missing and then they get frustrated and then they stick their first one and there's no stopping. Once you do it, once you stick any size fish, it doesn't matter. I think you're actually a better bow fisherman if you can shoot a small fish versus a big fish. But uh, the tournaments, and I'm glad you brought that up, decibel, I'm not even going to put out a number. I knew what it was. 65. There you go. Perfect. And that's from how many feet? Like, I think it's 35, think, 37 feet. or It's something yep. weird with a decibel rating. Yep. And that's for noise because we're running these lights with a generator uh, or I guess your battery, some guys do for a small length of time. But uh, the new efficient generators, you're well under that, you know, at that feet. But they will, I have been checked. And they go through everything, just like if you're checked in open water fishing or ice fishing. Um, so, you know, know your regulations on that. But tournaments not only aid in helping us bow fishermen, but also lake associations. Um, if you break down tournaments, they have there's a ton of bounty, bounty tournaments or bounty fishing. Um, for example, Douglas County just had theirs um, last weekend, which was June 6th. I think it was a Saturday, so it was a 12-hour, I believe it was noon to 6. I don't I don't even know the times, but uh, numbers, They the whole tournament, I think they, uh, they, they shot 800 fish, 800 invasive fish, which is, you know, some tournaments that's really, really big, some tournaments that's really, really small. But, uh, and usually you have a big, I think a lot of them are going to a big 6 or big 5. Yep. Am I right? Yep, big 6 has been very, very popular. And then they'll have a big fish. Some of them will have a little fun with the smallest fish, and then, of course, numbers, you know, can win you. So there's a lot of different categories. I've never seen so many guys go bull-legged and broke trying to f- shoot bullheads just for the numbers, you know. But sometimes that's what you get to shoot at. Yep. So, I mean, that's where also tournament fishing, it's not just one category. Like, so say you have a lake, you may shoot six fish a night, but that may be your big six. So, I mean, that's why – even in your tournaments, you're still able to go after exactly maybe your home lake. Maybe you are close to your home lake. You're able to go after what you know. Let's, uh, we have listeners that like to relive our experiences we found doing these podcasts. Take a night or a day, your best bow fishing memory. What it is, take us from start to finish. As we go around the horn, Jason, you start off. What What is your most memorable experience bow fishing? You know, was it a big fish or was it numbers or or just take us through the whole the whole deal? Oh, I would say easily the best, probably the most memorable time I've ever had. Me and my father in law was probably about ninety degrees out, and we just decided to go for a ride around that St. Cloud area, and we came across a creek that was maybe. Two and a half, three feet across, and there was a pool that was probably about twenty by thirty feet, and there were so many carp in there that you you couldn't miss. It was so full of carp, so I snuck down and I blocked the creek that was only two feet wide, mm-hmm. and I was kicking fish back up, and <laughs> they were just swirling around. We we filled a fifty five gallon barrel on a creek that probably ten months out of the year doesn't even hardly have water in it. Alex? So mine not being fishing too many years and stuff like that, but this year is going to be this spring. Um, One of my good friends is like, hey, you want to come out and shoot on my boat? And it was actually the first time I've ever got out and shot on a boat before. Um, He knew what was going to happen. He knew that there was a lot of fish there, and he, he knew what he was doing. And so we went out, and within the first 50 yards of shore, I mean, fish were scattering everywhere on the boat. Um kind of on a, like a road type of deal with like culverts coming out of it so then you'd run up there with the lights as soon as the lights got up there a fish come screaming out and i mean within a matter of an hour and a half two hours we had a hundred gallon tank full of fish it was 
it was a very, very fun night. So, I mean, 90 fish in around two hours, I mean, that's what, really got, that's what got me hooked into it. And now leading to me having my own boat, wanting to have that same success someday. Addicted, I could say. You could say addicted. Scott? Yep. Oh, I think my favorite night as a family member is going to kill me would be I took a couple family members out for the first time. And his wife had never, ever shot a bow. And we had met at the Axis about a half hour before dark. I explained to them how everything works. You know, aim low. When you think you're low enough, aim a little mm-hmm. lower. You're going to get close. Um, we got out on the lake, and she got up on the deck and goes, I don't know if I can do this because we'll get into deck height here in a minute. Yep. I said, you'll be okay. Just get in that corner and lean into it. You'll be all right. And we didn't go more than, I don't know, 15 yards I told her, there's a dogfish, shoot that. And she drew back and hits this dogfish. <laughs> her first time ever shooting a bow. And her husband looked at me and goes, I thought you said this is going to be hard. And I kind of went, I don't know. <laughs> and we had to stop and take pictures. And it was a great time. And the best part was he didn't hit a fish all night <laughs> long. <laughs> and she was shooting them left and right to the point that I actually had to quit shooting because she would draw on everything. Really? We had to kind of watch her to yeah, make sure. Yeah. But it was just... It was a blast that night. We had so many laughs and such a good time. With my favorite is taking people out that have never done it before and letting them experience that. Absolutely, you know. So I love it. So my the best night that I've ever had, and it actually it was two birds with one stone. I'm going to say the lake's name so you have a little bit of an idea of where we're going. Let's get her pen and paper. Oh boy. <laughs> Hold on just a minute. <laughs> so if, if anybody out there has never fished clear water, it used to be the happening spot. Now it's like 20 boats a night can be chaotic. But clear water, if the water level is high enough, you can actually get to three different bodies of water. Four if you count the little north part. We started and we hammered fish in reeds, new reeds, old reeds. We hammered fish in lily pads. We hammered fish on sand bodies. Uh, that lake has it all. We went back in the back and we had filled. So we have a hundred gallon black, uh, water tank, bought it at fleet farm that was filled. Okay. And we had just a little 40 horse motor. We were shooting fish and we had to go over and we were putting them on the floor of the boat. So we were to get back and And I keep looking at Alex cause he knows exactly where I was at. To get back to where we shot all that fish to where we landed the boat, instead of it being a 25-minute boat ride, took us an hour. We got back to the landing, and there's a little itty-bitty bay. We're like, well, one more little turn, right? And we were in 17 feet of water cutting across this bay, and all of a sudden I seen, and, and in our lights, there it's like a yellow glow, right? There's a yellow glow that looked like a small beluga whale. We got right up on it, and I got down on the rail, and I get really, really low to the water, and I shot this fish, and I shoot, like I was telling you, on a fire eagle, and I it's maxed out at 50 pounds. I stuck this fish, and the 25 yards of line that I had in that bottle was gone like that. We chased her down, and we put two other arrows, and she weighed 44 pounds. Jeez. So on that same night, we shot 137 fish. 32 of them were over 30 pounds with the max being 44 that happened in one night. Now I've been on clear water since, and I've been out there this year and I had a hard time in five hours getting 20 fish in the boat. So we're doing our job now. Granted water, water temperature has a ton to do with it. Spawn has a ton to do with it. Um, reliving that. Let's talk a little bit. You just touched on it. Water deflection and height of your deck. In the daylight, it's a whole different game than it is at night. Um, explain a little bit about what we're, the refraction. Is that how you say it? Yeah, water refraction. refraction of the light? So you said aim low. If you think you're low enough, aim a little lower, and then even just a little bit lower if you want to. Max depth that you guys have shot fish in, and what are you doing in differences? Explain a little bit about the refraction. Well, basically, what you see when you're looking at the fish, the the way the water reflects the light, the fish, I guess, is a lot closer to you than it looks. It looks like it's just below the surface. Maybe the fish is six feet away from you, and it's down in three feet of water. Well, that fish looks like it's literally just six feet away from you, but that fish 
you would be aiming at that fish to maybe it's two and a half to three feet away from you mm-hmm. to, I guess if that makes sense, it's... Yeah, it absolutely does. I mean, you could shoot, I know Scott's watched me do it, I shot over the back of 30 fish in a row one night, just you, you that's a hard adjustment sometimes is when you think you're aiming low enough, maybe, and that's what I'm talking earlier when I said something about bad for your form, maybe do like a swinging motion down <laughs> and let go yeah. <laughs> because it's, everything's different. And like you said, it's different during the day too. And that was a big adjustment for me when I first started was a lot of almost all day fishing. Mm-hmm. And then when they allowed lights mm-hmm. off of shore, cause you have lights mm-hmm. in the boat, but when I started, yeah. you can have lights on shore when you were walking on shore. So all of our boat fishing was during the day. Okay. Yeah. And I, um, Alex, how, how high is your, is your deck right on the boat or is it lifted? Yep, right on my gunnels on the side. And then so Scott, yours is? I'm about a foot off the top of my boat. So you see a lot of rigs. Let's say the big money rigs, they have an elevated deck and then they have a lower deck. Um, I don't have big money. We have just a deck and it's right on the boat. But if I was going to have to just fish day, the first thing I would be doing is elevating and the deck one so you can get up in the air and you can see because daylight and you guys agree or disagree the fish are a lot spookier they can be yeah i mean unless they're spawn and we all know how that goes but you have to be quiet you have to be elevated to get out to them sometimes you're shooting fish that are 10 15 feet i don't know about 15 feet but you're fit you're shooting fish a lot further away And, and can an elevated platform be good at night yeah, you just see down in the water a whole lot better. And then mm-hmm. it kind of depends on how high your lights are off that deck, too. Like, the first time I got my boat, I had the lights way too close to the water. And then we had to move them up, and then we could see a lot further out from the boat. Mm-hmm. You know, so just there's a lot of things that come into play there. But usually the higher, the better, just because you see down into the water better, mm-hmm. in my opinion. A little bit better angle of attack. Correct. And then there's, there. it's funny, let's say guys that are not fishing a lake, that are just uh, walking in. Um, <clears throat> we have a good friend that works at Archer Country, Isaac. All he does strictly is from shore, rather be a creek or, or a bay, back bay. He'll he'll see fish from up on the road or, you know, up on top of the culvert, but when he gets down to the level, and he stands like three foot six anyways, <laughs> he can't see them, you know. So that's where an elevated platform during the day, uh, I think, will help you a ton. But this has been awesome. Just talk. We could talk bow fishing forever, and uh, that's a cool thing. Is we're right in this. Uh, this podcast will be in the later part of June, first part of July, but uh, we're right in the heart of bow fishing. Um, some of you, you guys up here in the North Country, as we talk about spawn, you know, a lot of times uh, carp won't spawn until water temp is above sixty four. I think some lakes right now, surface temp is seventy four, seventy five in that area as you go down deeper. So probably by the time that everyone's listening to this, most of the carp are going to be spawned out for the most part. Um, but you can still shoot them all over everywhere and have a blast doing it. Just, just come into the shop. If you have any questions, any of the three locations, and if there's not a guy there that, uh, that bow fishes, which would be hard to believe. I think everybody in every shop probably does or has. Yeah. I don't think you'll find anybody. And it's not, it hasn't been out. don't be intimidated because you're, you're not dropping, you're not taking out a loan to come get a bow fishing rig. You can come in here, we can hook you up. And especially if you got your own, um, all the shops have all the equipment and we can set you. And then we can just talk stories. We can kind of help you out and, and send you where you need to be. Is there anything else you guys, uh, you want to touch on for today as far as bow fishing as a total? I think we covered a lot of things. We have, there's some open-ended questions, but. For the most part, we got it all taken care of. Want to thank you guys, uh, Scott and Alex and Jason. Uh, another great uh, episode. Look uh, forward to if you haven't already subscribed to all of our podcasts. Uh, get your notifications. Also, we got a YouTube channel. We're gonna have some bow fishing things coming out. Um, got some equipment reviews. Pretty cool equipment reviews. Especially Alex has got some that he's released. So go to YouTube channel. Click subscribe and then also on the bell so you get your notifications. Check out our Facebook page as we have a bunch of giveaways and cool things going to it. 
On behalf of Archery Country Podcast, it's been a blast, guys. Thank you. We'll see everyone down the road. Thank you for listening to Archery Country Podcast. 